and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from our ta from our Tamis Games, and the creator of the of the upcoming All Ages um, form of TTRPG, the one and only Rene Lousdale. No hoping... one at all. <laughs> I'm hoping I got that right. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing uh, better than yesterday. <laughs> For me, for me, the for me, I'm glad that the worst of summer is over. Oh, don't I know it? We have had too hot a summer this this year. I think everybody has in one in one form or another. There's a reason they call August the dog days. So true. Because you may as well sweat like one. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm not favorite of uh, going around with my chucky stuck out, but yeah. I'm not. E I'm not either. But with how, but with how bad it can get, sometimes sometimes it doesn't seem like a bad idea, or j or just um, asking a f asking a fireman to shoot you with the hose. True. So Disc true. Disclaimer: Please don't ask a fireman to get to shoot you with a hose because you will be on your ass. And it will hurt. I mean, I I can handle it, but that's but that's because I did. That's because I did wait. That's because of the. Crazy stunts that I've that I've done over the years. Um, still, le still less painful than getting hit with a bar stool. I did stunt work once, so there's that. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. But I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, as I as is my tradition around here. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. So, um, when I was a child, I was uh, diagnosed with arthritis, and uh, to cope with that, I came to the world of role-playing games, where I could actually become either someone else or someone who mattered, no matter what my condition was. And uh, a lot of the grown-ups around the community of uh, the role-playing games at my school was actually helpful and wanted to uh, take me in and show me how things worked and accepted me as the person that I were. And I would love to give all that back to children and kids that have a little bit of trouble getting into the normal workings of a school day or just have some great imagination that they need to to show to others. Mm -hmm. And were there were there and were there any were there any um, role playing games that were that were kind of a formative experience for for you specifically? I know I know for a lot of people it'd be tempting to say D and D, but I've gotten some surprising answers over the years. I've been doing this. For the most part, for uh, tabletop uh, role-playing games, it was actually uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Mm -hmm. But for for the most of the live-action role-play, I were so lucky to be in, in uh, Herning in Denmark, mm -hmm. where a couple of guys actually worked on creating their own settings. Not Dungeons & Dragons, not all the normal stuff that you use. Mm -hmm but created settings that were child-friendly. And by creating this, they gave another perspective on how to be, how to react to others and how to react to things that goes wrong in your life. And they just gave stats according to how well you actually performed in, in the uh, role-playing part of the game. So, in in many regards, the the homemade materials were actually the ones that stuck most with me. Mm -hmm. Which, 
is you're in good company on that front since a lot since a lot of game since there's quite a few games over the years that started out as started out as homebrew and then kind of got out of control until exactly they, I, until they became I, their own thing yeah i think uh, almost any type of game will have been created by some point by someone who had a shall we say over life uh, above life imagination and just needed an outlet for it And when it now with a, with Academy of Heroes was was that was that something that you had that st that started out as a heavily modified version of something that came before that that kind of spun off into its own thing? No, Academy of, Me of Heroes actually became uh, a thing doing my educational uh, as as a pedagogue. Pedagog, um, where I found a friend who had uh, started to build a game from scratch, and I came in and we just went nuts by creating this, and then we thought, hey, this is actually great to play with kids because it it's very basic. It's it's a setting that you can put anything into and just let your imagination run wild mm -hmm. and then we started creating the the basic system for it and just put on adventures and then we tried it with both grown-ups and uh, with kids and both groups were actually thrilled of being part of it and trying something completely different yeah now when I when I looked at the when I looked at the basic rules, like um, obviously one of the things I can appreciate is the reliance on um, on symbols. But what? But one thing I was a, I was a bit curious about is that there, on the sheet that you that you have here, you have eight yep. you have um, eight stats, and I'd like I'd like to go in I'd like to go into each pair from pair from left to right to kind of get a feel for each of them some of them were detailed in the material you sent me but so, but um there's some of them that I might have a few a few questions on yeah so I'd I would like to I would like to start with the with the two with the two symbols that are le that are left most on yeah. the sheet, on the sheet. So, on specifically, just for the sake, just for the sake of convenience, I'm specifically referring to the stat symbols that you have in this image. Uh, yes, the uh, the heart and the uh, potion. I take it. Mm -hmm. So the heart symbol is uh, where you put down how many. Uh, standard lives uh, that your character have meaning the the standard number of hits you can take before going down mm -hmm. uh, and the potion is the standard amount of energy uh, that your character will start the game with so the energy is uh, the basis for all your abilities so every time you use an ability, you will go down in energy, and then at the start of your next turn, you will get plus one energy back. Mm -hmm. Which, um, which is is good is, and if I recall correctly, you have you have it set up where the life and energy boxes on the sheet are tracked using a D twelve. Exactly, because when you uh, get your cards, your abilities, and your equipment and such, uh, then those uh, equipment or abilities might add to the life as a bonus. So your starting life in the game might actually be higher than your basic life, but you cannot heal over the basic amount of life that's on your character sheet. So no, no overhealing, got it. Yeah. Um. 
as far as the two in the next column, I'm guessing that is your attack and defense values. Exactly. And they are, they are a fixed bonus that you add to the d10 when you roll it when you roll the dice. When someone attacks you, it's the player that rolls the dice, not the uh, not the game master, not the monster or opponent. Mm -hmm. The monster and opponent will always have fixed stats. So what you need to roll is higher or equal to the stat that they have to either hit or defend yourself. Is it a case like Cypher where the majority of the rolling is going to be done by players? Uh, almost every role is going to be done by the players. Specifically, saying that the game master will have to roll. Uh, for instance, if a zombie goes down to zero hit points, you may roll a dice uh, as the game master. Hmm. And if it's above a certain number, the zombie will go back on its feet with one life left. All right. That's that's the only roles the game master will have in the basic rule system. Mm -hmm. And the third co the third column, I believe, that is your that is your re that is your two resources: action points and treasure. Exactly. So action points are used to buy abilities and uh, buy another uh, subclass to your main class when you upgrade to the epic rule system. And the treasures is for either paying for information. Uh, some adventures have that you can pay for information and get some extra insight into what happens. And for equipment. And later on, you can also use treasures into your abilities or to actually uh, pay to get an NPC to join your party. Now, with with that in with that in mind, um, and I'll, I'll actually there's one I was there's one thing I was going to ask on that, but I'll hold the, off on that. And the last the last two I can the top one I'm guessing is your movement speed, but the map symbol I what is that equip is that akin to a knowledge check? Uh, no, the map symbol is the range that your attacks have. So uh, the normal attack range for any hero will be one, and then your uh, to make it simple for the players, uh, they will have the same symbol with a plus on it, mm -hmm. if it adds to the range that you can you can make an attack. So a bow will be plus three, mm -hmm. so one plus three will be four. So you can have a range of four uh, segments. Uh, and others have that um, at spear, you can have a range of two, uh, plus one, so you have two range to actually hit further with the melee, melee attack that you use. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, from what I, from what I'm seeing, you are you you are utilizing a a um, class a class system of a of a sort. It isn't full. It isn't full on free form. Um, is it a case where where your choice of classes go, is going to determine the starting stats and a pool of and a pool of potential um, ab ab abilities that would be exclusive to it? Exactly. So any abilities that you have will be exclusive to the class that you choose. But any class can use any and all types of equipment. So some some equipment might uh, be uh, be and gain give you an ability to make yourself invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the cloak of shadows. And others, the dwarven hammer might give you the ability to hit someone and make them move one uh, pace away from you. So you get some abilities mixed in with some of the equipment if you want to utilize. For instance, the warrior's uh, heavy hit or the thief's uh, invisibility. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to advancement, is that primarily handled by get by the GM granting <coughs> um, ability points and or treasure? 
Uh, yes, there's no uh, leveling up as such. Uh, what you gain is ability points to give uh, the players the opportunities to get new attacks, uh, new effects, and uh, use the character as a totally uh, new uh, form of character than you were used to from the beginning. And uh, the equipments will also uh, interact with specific types of abilities. So you will always be the same character as you started with, but you have the opportunity to evolve the type of uh, combat that you gain. You also always have the opportunity before starting a game to sell one of your abilities or equipment for half the price rounded down so that you can gain a new one if it will help the uh, the, the group as a whole in, in a specific campaign. Then you're not stuck to the abilities yet that you have on your paper. You can always sell them and buy a new one. Yeah, although it, although it looks like from from some of the from some of the material the the um se the amount the cost and the cost and the sale is seems to be um, seems to be um that is that is always more expensive it's always higher to buy than it is to sell yeah because uh, when you constantly go into um, into the adventures then you will be awarded a specific amount per adventure of ability points at the end of it. And then the, the game master will be able to award above that if he or she thinks that, oh, okay, you actually did something very useful, very cool, or you extended yourself beyond what you normally do uh, either at school or against your friends or something like that. So you you will always be able to reward a person for either playing better or being a bigger person or uh, doing something that they are not used to doing. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in mind, when when doing play, <clears throat> when it comes to when it, when it comes to the when it comes to the cards themselves, do you have it set it? Do you have it set as the, as if there's a um a, a equip a um treasure deck and a um cl and a class deck? Yeah, uh, every um, uh, the cards will be uh, for every ability. You will have a card so that you can put it down on your character sheet. And you can, you will always be able to read what the ability does, and uh, reference to the symbols that's in the bottom right side of the card. Then there will be a uh, this, yeah. Then there will be a, a picture of what the card uh, looks like. Uh, if it's a crossbow, it's a crossbow. If you run around with uh, a poison, you see a picture of the specific poison that you have. Mm -hmm. And then there will always be a cost in the upper right corner. Yeah. Now, in the in the do, in the document that you had sent, it seemed that there were that when it came to the base classes, you you were you were kind of leaning on on a ba on a basic set of four are those the four classes that would be that would be in there that you have planned for the full size book? Yeah, the the um, the basic rule set will have the the four hero classes that are warriors, uh, the thief, the archer, and the magician. Mm -hmm. um, but every one of them will then have a sizable upgrades of three. So you actually have the opportunity to direct the individual character of the hero to three individual specific detailed uh, heroes that uh, if you have the warrior, for example, you will be able to become a knight or a holy knight or a magical knight uh, and a mercenary. 
would, uh, those, um, would those be akin to subclasses or prestige classes? Uh, I would call them uh, prestige classes because you upgrade to them. You don't uh, put them in. You do, you don't take a subclass as a magician, for example. When you're a warrior, you don't take magician, mm -hmm. but you can take a magical warrior that have some of the skills of a magician, but you're still focused on the warrior part. Yeah. And you will still be able to uh, use and uh, take some of the warrior's abilities and not only the magical warrior. Which, that certainly makes sense. That certainly makes sense. And, well, since, every, since all roads lead to energy... You're not gonna. You're not gonna have the <laughs> the thing that's caused me to pick to pick on um to pick on mages for years. No, ev everything is counted as an energy. When you become an, a magician, you will automatically start with more energy than the others, but you will be more squishy. Which so you don't have such much life. <laughs> exactly. Is because what... some of the spells will actually be overpowered, but you can use them once every three or fourth turn. And given given the fact that you're that you have it set up where you're always recovering one, um, always recovering one point of energy. Have in your playtests have you had any instances of people playing um, defensively? <laughs> A lot of the players that I'm playing with right now uh, uses up a lot of energy at the beginning of the game and then just play defense until they got uh, enough energy left to, to actually become more dangerous to the, the enemies. But it depends on both the, the style of the people playing, but it also depends on how much they have prepared for the actual game. So if you know that you're going to run low because you uh, you need to burn a lot of energy in the beginning, then you need to buy energy elixirs and bring them. But if you don't think of doing that, then you have to, to be defensive a lot of the time. It's, so you, ha you, you have to think ahead. <laughs> That certainly makes sense, and with with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, a lot a lot of times the a lot of times when pe when people have made games that that are that are built for newcomers or built for a young audience, it's usually it it's usually a, there's the thing of it being about um, bringing in young players, but have have you considered within within the text for as far as putting it putting in advice for for young gms uh yes in uh, in the um, adventure book uh, every advent adventure will be uh, written so that there's a story there are note for the gms there are a tip and a guideline for the GMs, and there's a reward system at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So in, in, every, in, in every encounter, you can either uh, go by the book, you can go uh, and change some of the stuff, uh, and it says how to change it, uh, what to do if, if you don't quite, uh, if, if you're not a what's it called um, if you're not such an experienced game master and how you should uh, set the mood for the game mm -hmm. and for experienced game masters they can just ignore that, that bit with the tip and the guidelines that certainly makes sense <clears throat> now with with that in with that in with that in mind, um, because of the because of the influence of cards, have you consider have you considered doing a print and play uh, a print and play option for the card materials? 
this uh, stage of the product uh, with the Kickstarter and such, you will actually have both the print and play option and you will have the uh, you can buy this uh, so that you have it physically mm. uh, what what I'm doing myself is uh, I have taken the physical cards dealt them out and then if we need to change something to suit a specific person better then I print the the card again, but with different colors, so that they know that this is the type of skill or equipment that is specially designed for this person. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And with the, with all of that with all of that in with all of that in mind, um. I'd like to ask what's, what you'd consider some of the learning experiences you've had in testing this game out in the out in the wild. A lot of what I learned by testing it is that if you have to if if you want to make a game and if you want to make it correctly, you need to test it with the people that it is uh, made for in this case we case we made it for kids so we took we took it to the kids and we asked them what kind of new things what kind of abilities what kind of uh, equipment what kind of stories would you like to actually go to actually have mm -hmm. and by including them, we came up with a lot of new stuff and uh, cool stuff uh, and a lot of new types of adventure to, to go on. Not the the usual that I, I'm seeing a lot of when, when playing with some kids uh, that they just want to go out and kick stuff and s explode things and such. But more and more of them, after a while, actually wanted to do puzzles and wanted to go on adventures when they, where they had to solve problems, not by force, but by wits. So it's, you, you really need to listen to the audience and not just for the first part of it. You need to actually have it, have it in mind all the way through. Which, what I find, what I, what I find, what I find interesting with that is the idea of doing puzzles because even ge even games made for, for for far older crowds don't don't touch the idea of puzzles in campaigns. Um. Oh. Uh, a lot of um, the stuff that uh, will be going into the the adventure book is that you will have many types of reward resolvents. So if you are going into the town of uh, Mercantile and you need to help them with the food problem that they have, mm. they have goblins running amok and stealing their food and poisoning it and such, you will, normally, you would just, okay, we need to kill the goblins. But why kill the goblins if you can actually hide the food, save it, and give them something that will actually make them leave you alone? Then you don't have to uh, think about what happens when they come back again the next morning. Then they're actually gone. And not just killed they will actually just be leaving and you will have resolved something peacefully uh, in the grave uh, grave tomb uh, you will need to do uh, a bit of puzzling where you need to find specific gems put them in the the correct sockets in the correct order mm -hmm. to actually open a door Every time that you do it in the wrong order, you might get attacked by zombies. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it, it just continues in, the, in, in those types of uh, puzzling and uh, think arounds of what you actually do. Yeah. And what I find one thing that one thing that I'm curious about is when it comes to tre when it comes to treasure and the like. Um, how would you how would you handle AG AGM giving giving cer giving certain magic items? So yeah. in spe in specific adventures, mm -hmm. uh, there will be a uh, a what's it called um, a specific item that you need to use. Uh, you need to recover a magical mirror. Uh, and you actually need slots on your heritage sheet to put that mirror. Because if you don't, if you filled out all the the six slots on your on your character sheet, you can't carry anymore. Hmm. So if take it or give it to someone else, and that mirror might actually benefit the person. So it's a part of the adventure. But if you choose to keep it instead of actually using it for what it's for, then you have something to boost you, but you have not done the the assignment on the quest. Mm -hmm. And if, for instance, if you as a GM wants to create uh, a magical item to give the party, uh, then you, you are free to do it, but... Uh, Keeping in mind that there are, uh, we will have some guidelines as to how to create these items, so that you actually have uh, a system for. If it's a two-handed weapon, you will normally have these stats, and then you can put in an ability or something. Mm -hmm. And given given how whether it be abilities or or equipment, it's all it's all in those six slots on the sheet. Have you put yeah. in have you put in certain restraints so that so that people don't try and carry a bu carry, try and use a bunch of weapons at once? Is there is there a limit when it comes to equipment types? Yes, um, for instance, a two-handed sword. If you run around run around with a two-handed weapon, you cannot run around with a shield or a dagger or something like that. Uh, if for instance, you want to swap it away, you use your attack to do this. Mm -hmm. you, you can still use other items, uh, certain abilities that doesn't uh, require your attack ro uh, attack for the turn, but it, it restrains you from just using away and just adding the bonuses together. Uh, and if you want to, um, for instance, dual wield something, then you have to dual wield this it where it's uh, two one-handed weapons. Mm -hmm. So you're not dual dual wielding two so two um, two spears. Mm -hmm. And as as. In that in that same vein, I'm, gu I'm guessing you have you have the rule that you can that you can't have multiple um, sets of sets of armor. No, you you use one piece of armor if uh, if for instance you are wearing a chain mail uh, and you find a plate mail, then you'll have to choose between which one of them is the one that you got on. Uh, for instance, if you if you have the chainmail, you will uh, be able to um, to get a, a plus for your uh, defense. But with the plate mail, you will have a plus for your defense, a plus for your uh, bonus life, and your uh, your movement will be reduced by one. Mm -hmm. so you have to choose which one will you be wearing, and you cannot change that in the middle of combat. And based on based on the way you've set it up, you 
would it be fair of me to say that it's not that um if the wizard wants to go around in chain mail then he then he can in this system yeah he will be able to wear chain mail if he wants to Now, with with all of that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for th for this? Uh, so the book itself will be in uh, A five uh, and uh, half a uh, normal uh, sheet of paper, mm -hmm. and will be about forty or fifty pages long, and that's. Everything included. That's everything, except the adventure will be included in that book. Mm -hmm. And do you do you have any, do you have any plans on put on putting out on putting out a quick start or something similar down the road? Um, how do you think it need a quick start? In my mind, there are three possibilities. So, uh, a quick starter in case of uh, having a test run of it, or a smaller part of the book. Um, the former. Um, there will be um, a how should we say uh, a trial for for the game. Uh, that I am putting together so that uh, before uh, going in and investing it, you will be able to have a pre-made adventure with how uh, the stats works, and then you can use that and what's on the character sheets that are pre-printed so that you can actually try an adventure and see if the game is something to your liking. And it will have uh, one adventure with uh, three scenarios in it, uh, and will be about uh, with five character sheets and monsters and such in it. Will be about ten pages long. Mm -hmm. But with the, and no, with that in mind, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how your particular project develops but mm -hmm. with all of that said I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come up to my temple oh it was a pleasure and, and it's a pleasure <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as I often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged. Of course. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>